Hello, good evening. Hi. Thank you so much. Welcome. Welcome to um, the third of Inogen's In Conversation events. So, um, in case you don't know, Inogen has been running a series of um, talks, discussions. Uh, the idea being that we inform ourselves, we keep up to date on our uh, associates' uh, most recent research. We aim to widen um, our public debate and also uh, to, to open up that debate a little bit more and in, invite questions from a wider audience. So this evening is also week three of BioBusiness and I'm delighted to see all of our students in the audience. But as I mentioned, a special welcome to, to guests and visitors uh, here this evening. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Scannell. Um, and Jack started out at the University of Oxford with a PhD in neuroscience. Um, so he's been a teacher at Newcastle, uh, a management consultant, um, an equity analyst, head of discovery, um, uh, uh, discovery research at eTherapeutics and CEO at Etheros Pharmaceuticals. And also in parallel, he is an Inogen associate and a researcher. He's contributed massively to the academic literature on the subject. Uh, his interests lie mostly in innovation, drug discovery, um, antibiotics, diagnostics, and most recently in uh, clinical validity of testing. So Jack's most recent paper published last year, 2022, is on predictive validity, and that will be our focus uh, for the evening. So, but what I would like to do now is to let Jack say a few words um, from his own perspective on his research career, what's led him up to this point, um, his research interests and in, uh, what he's interested in now, and when it was that he first uh, came across issues in productivity in the pharmaceutical sector. So, Jack, welcome. Well, well, well thank you very much for that introduction, which, which makes me feel very, very old. Uh, but um, it's very kind, very kind as well. So, so I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my background. So I studied medicine a very long time ago. Um, as, as I say generally when I give a talk, to the great benefit of the English NHS, I never actually qualified or practised. Uh, I instead went and did a PhD in sort of quite a mixture of, sort of wet, proper sort of experimental physiology, but also computational stuff as well. I was a postdoc for a while. Um, at Oxford, then I was a lecturer at Newcastle. And from there, I went to work for a management consultancy firm where I did quite a lot of work in the drug industry, most of which wasn't very interesting work in the drug industry. It was stuff like, you know, how do you train sales forces? How do you merge drug companies? But I did a few more interesting things. Uh, and when I was doing that, which was in the sort of early 2000s, I sort of became aware of a massive mismatch between the sort of optimistic rhetoric, you know, that I, as a scientist, had put in my grant applications and the actual sort of discovery productivity of the drug industry, right? So, you know, lots of things seemed to be getting much, much better in terms of basic science, but it was clear that drug companies were finding it harder and harder and harder to discover drugs. And I got progressively interested in that over the years and it became even more obvious to me when I moved from working in consulting to working in investment. So around uh, 2007, I moved, no 2005, I moved from working for a consulting firm to working uh, for a, a sort of Wall Street investment company. I was based in London looking at European drug and biotech companies and when I was there I started looking more at the economics. And it was clear that if you looked at how much the drug industry spent per drug discovered, um, it had gone up a hundredfold between 1950 and 2010 um, if you adjusted for inflation, right? So it cost a hundred times more, but it cost roughly, roughly a billion. You know, we can sort of quibble whether it's one billion or three billion, but it's about a billion dollars spent in R&D per drug brought to market. Uh, you know, in 1950, you'd have got roughly a hundred drugs if you'd spent that amount of money in inflation adjusted terms. And this struck me as a sort of big policy puzzle, right, because the activities that I as a scientist and people working in the drug industry and people working in biomedical research thought were important for drug discovery, like for example sequencing DNA, well that had got 10, perhaps 100 billion times cheaper over the intervening period. Um, 
there's a very important technique called x-ray crystallography where you can look at the structure of proteins and then you can predict what's likely to work against them as a drug. Well, that got like 10, that got to 10,000 times cheaper. Has my microphone gone off? That it got, yeah, my microphone's gone off. Can I? I'll, 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 I'll talk more loudly, but it seems to have gone on again. Uh, that had got about 10,000 times cheaper, and one could have pointed to a large number of other technologies, right? So, so this struck me as a huge sort of policy puzzle. And if you went into the sort of academic and policy literature, there was, in my view, surprisingly little written about it. Uh, and generally what was written was from people who had a cure to sell rather than necessarily want to, seem to want to understand the problem. So, for example, you know, you could find stuff from consulting firms about how to fix the drug R&D productivity problem, and that was mainly around, you need to hire us to do an expensive consulting project for you, that'll fix the problem. Or, you know, the, the genomicists would say, you need to do more genomics, that'll fix the problem. And my view was, given the fact that many people have been trying to fix the problem using these tools for the last 40 years and they hadn't worked, maybe there were other diagnoses that should be more broadly discussed in the public domain. And that's what sort of made me write start writing about this around 2010, 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I found the 2012 paper absolutely fascinating. It, for me, it made everything more accessible and understandable in terms of productivity. It really hit the nail on the head. Um, so it was, it was a wonderful paper for, for me to read. Um, and it's a paper that we've uh, distributed to our students, uh, and they, they, every year they find it a, a great read. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us a bit more about uh, the causes of decline in the, in the industry? Okay, so, so, so I'll say something first about the, the general class categories of explanation. Right, so here's a process that notionally has got 100 times less efficient over 60 years, and all of the inputs appear to have got tens, hundreds, thousands, or billions of times more efficient over that time period. Right? There's sort of two broad classes of explanation. Right? One is what you might call the biological barrel scraping set of explanations, i.e., you know, we've discovered, however one defines easy, we've discovered the easy stuff, and we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. That's kind of one class of explanations, a kind of resource depletion set of explanations. And the other set of explanations are around, actually, what we've done is we've effectively, there's been a qualitative change in the way R&D is done, and what we've done is we've substituted superficially efficient but fundamentally ineffective activities for a, set of, for a set of things that actually were different and worked better, right? So you've got a sort of set of resource depletion arguments, you've got a set of misindustrialization arguments, right? And as I used to tease people in the drug industry with, and I still tease them with now, I always used to say that the more preposterous you think one of those classes of explanation, the more you're forced to agree with the other one. Right, so if you think, actually, we haven't scraped the biological barrel at all, there's lots of great stuff there, then the question is, well, why are we, why are we spending 100 times more per drug discovered, right? Or if you think, actually, the, uh, we've, we're scraping the barrel, then the, the question is, well, in that case, is it still worth throwing so much resource behind uh, pharmaceutical innovation? And I would say, um, again, if you look at sort of financial measures that investors apply to drug companies in the biotech industry, those have been declining fairly steadily since around 2000, uh, and they've been declining because the R&D costs have been going up a lot more than sales. So despite the fact that drugs are very expensive and a lot of you know, health systems now complain about the expense of new drugs, R&D costs have been growing much, much faster than drug industry revenue, uh, and that's pushing down the returns, and it's made sort of private sector R&D investment look less, sort of progressively less, less attractive over time. Sorry, that was a rather long preamble. But coming back to the causes, right, of these, these two, two broad classes, there was something that I called the better than the Beatles problem. And I may, you may want me to explain that a bit more. But that's kind of resource deplete, a sort of a, a, a weird kind of resource depletion problem. Um, another thing that had a huge impact on costs, very obvious if you look at the productivity trends, it's one of the few things that had an obvious impact on productivity, is regu regulation, possibly quite rightly, right, <laughs> makes drug R&D more expensive. So there was a dip in productivity around 1962, which is when the FDA suddenly said, you have to show that drugs work, right? You can't simply just argue they're safe. You have to do efficacy trials. And that was, that was after thalidomide. And if you look at lots of things like, for example, there's, there's lovely examples in diabetes where 
you know, there have been progressive or there have been a number of safety problems associated with earlier diabetes drug classes. And every time once something like that happens, the new diabetes drug classes have to show that they don't have the same safety problem. That can be very expensive. So, for example, with diabetes drug classes, there were some classes of drugs which I think were probably approved in the 80s, which they reduce your blood glucose, which is kind of what you want in diabetes, but actually they also increase cardiovascular risk, right? So, they, so patients could actually die of other things from taking these drugs. And as a result of that, the FDA said, the big drug reg regulator said, okay, now you have to do, if you're going to launch a diabetes drug, as part of your clinical trial program, you have to do these large cardiovascular outcome studies, right, which are very, very large and expensive. So it used to be, you know, you could get a new insulin approved with 2,000 patients. You know, now the big programs have maybe 20, 30,000 patients, right? So you see that sort of thing. Um, so the, re the regulation makes things more expensive. Again, often one could argue quite rightly, but it does. Um, I think that there has been an element of misindustrialization, which I think is related to resource depletion, right? Because in a sense, if you've depleted the resources that you could use the old technologies on, right, then some of the new technologies you adopt may not work as well. And then I also think actually until around 2000, the industry was making great returns. So almost any problem, you, the, the rational response was to throw money at it. Right, so if, if you're in an industry that's doing quite well and the rational response to a problem is throw money at it, that tends to make it less efficient, right, over time. And it's probably only been since 2000 or, you know, that, that actually people have started thinking much more about efficiency. So a combination of things. The best in the Beatles problem, regulatory standards increasing, um, the misindustrialization of certain things, and a general lack of cost sensitivity for much of the 50, 1950 to 2010 period. Could you go back to the better than Beatles problem and ex explain that a little bit more? So, one thing that is a sort of weird sort of resource depletion that you see in the drug industry, and you may see it in some other industries as well, but you don't, a lot of industries you don't see it in, is what we call the better than the Beatles problem. And, you know, this, the fact we called it that both shows our age and it shows that I wrote the paper a few years ago. But the general idea is this, right? So, so, so imagine how hard it would be to commercialise new music. If every, if every new record had to be better than the Beatles, uh, if you could download all of the old Beatles records for free, and if you didn't get bored of listening to the Beatles over and over again. Right? So if you had those criteria, it would, become, it would be difficult to launch commercialised new pop music. Now, in the drug industry, you have almost exactly that issue because new drugs tend to be launched at high prices with patent protection, right? and you wouldn't run the clinical trials otherwise. But after... 10 years on the market, 15 years on the market, they go generic, and their price can fall by a factor of 100 in some cases, right? So a drug, you know, might cost 10 cents a pill or less. And, but it still works just as well as it did, and the doctors don't get bored of prescribing it. So there's a number of therapy areas where you have this ever-improving back catalogue of nearly free stuff against which any new medicines would have to compete. And... Um, so, again, if we look at the example of diabetes, right, you, you, you now have um, numerous different classes, many of which contain numerous generic drugs. And you know that if you launch a new diabetes drug, patients are only going to get it if they've tried all of these other things, probably. Right? And all of those other things, the doctors know how to prescribe them, they're in, in guidelines, you know what they work for, etc., etc. So metformin, a classic diabetes drug, would be the diabetes equivalent to the Beatles, right? And it's now the case, that if you, and this has happened to more and more therapy areas, and it's now the case in the US that if you look at US prescriptions, more than 90% of prescriptions in the US and in the UK are for generic drugs whose patents have expired. And this has pushed R&D into those therapy areas where the drug industry has been relatively unsuccessful for the last 100 years, right? And one way or another, those are going to be difficult, <laughs> right? So... So that, that's the best in the Beatles problem. And, and probably some other industries face it as well. Like I'd say crop protection chemicals face it. But a lot of intellectual property industries don't. So because in many intellectual property industries like publishing or music, people get bored of the old intellectual property. So there's a market for new stuff, even if it's not object objectively better than the old stuff. And can I take you back to the second of those problems? Um, and you describe it as the cautious regulator problem. Is the regulator really too cautious? So I, I think if I was writing the paper again, I'd call it something else, right? So, so I think there, there is definitely a sort of regulatory ratchet, 
Um, and in therapy areas where you've got a lot of the best of the Beatles going on, like in type 2 diabetes, where there are a lot of good drugs that are pretty safe, um, where the, you know, diabetes it's bad to have, but it's not going to kill you quickly most of the time, right, where the risks to patients of taking unsafe medicines would be high, I think the regulator sta regulatory standards are justifiably high. And I think you've had a sort of bit of a co-evolution, so, so the sort of pipeline of the drug industry has shifted towards, it's very he heavily oncology-related at the moment, mm -hmm. It's very heavily skewed towards kind of rare, serious, rare diseases. I mean, that's, that's not the only thing the drug industry is doing, but there's a, there's a, a lot of the pipeline is, is skewed in that area. And the reason is that the regulator tends to be more permissive in those therapy areas where um, outcomes are pretty poor and where the therapeutic choices are poor. Um, and I think at the moment I would struggle to argue that in those therapy areas the regulator is too cautious. I mean, I think a lot of very sensible people think that you know, lots, a lot of oncology drugs that are being approved at the moment are not, not wildly useful, um, but are, are pretty toxic, right? So I think, you know, I think the, yeah, I would be reluctant to... And certainly I know, I mean, I've done a fair amount of anti, work on antimicrobials over the years, and again, I think there was a sort of massive... Um, the regulator became rather more permissive probably around 10 years ago, in response to some of the, pro the, the documented problems of bringing antimicrobials to market. So there were big changes in the regulations for sort of certain antimicrobials, which have made it easier. Mm -hmm. So certainly in antimicrobials, which is a therapy area I know a bit about, I don't think people think the barriers are now regulatory. I think they're more, in that therapy area, they're more commercial. Mm -hmm. um, so in your paper, you talked about um, the tendency to overestimate the ability of basic research um, to, to translate into new drugs. Could you... Say more about that. Yeah, so, and in fact, this may not be a bad place to show a couple of slides, actually, which, which, I, which, we, which we made. So can I... Of course. Yeah, let, let's, let's, let's do that. Would you like me to... OK, so, so this one... Uh, is, is there a point, or should I just sort of stand up and point? I'll, I'll, is there a point? I'll, I, may, I may as well show a few graphs, seeing as I brought them. Um, so this... this here is the decline in R&D productivity. So this is the number of new drugs per billion dollars spent on the vertical axis. This is time, logarithmic axis. So you had roughly a hundredfold fall from 1950 to around 2010. It's gone up a bit since then, partly because the drug industry started looking more at rare diseases, oncology. You've had more sort of slicing and dicing of, of indications. Um, here's genomics getting 10 billion times cheaper. There's X-ray crystallography getting 10,000 times cheaper. Um, and I'll leave those up there because this, this will sort of help me talk a bit about misindustrialization. So, um, the, 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 I'll give you a very nice example, actually. I'll give a good concrete example. Um, in the world's first use, useful antimicrobial was a, no, the world's, probably the world's second useful antimicrobial was a drug called sulfonilamide or prontosil which was discovered by a guy called Gerhard Domack, working at Bayer in the early 1930s. And at the time, you know, we didn't have the massive collections of compounds that drug companies now have. We didn't have the computational methods to sort of work out computationally what compounds might stick to a protein structure. You know, you had to sort of get the compounds, of which there weren't many, and then you had to laboriously test them in animals. Right, so Gerhard Domack screened a couple of hundred compounds from the Bayer medicinal chemistry collection, which actually was a dye stuff collection pretty much at the time. And he found Prontosil, which um, uh, uh, treated sepsis in mice, and it also treats certain sorts of sepsis in people. <coughs> and um, between 1995 and 2005, a number of large drug companies made efforts to discover new broad-spectrum antibiotics. And they had a wonderfully rational way of doing it. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to sequence the genomes of bacteria, or you know, rather we're going to do a clever genomic method. We're going to look for genes that are essential for the survival across a, range, a wide range of potential bacterial pathogens because the products of those genes will be good drug targets. Right? And we're going to make sure that those genes don't have close homologs in people because if they don't have close homologs in people, they won't be poisonous. And they conducted around 100 high-throughput screening campaigns. And high-throughput screening campaigns are where you take the protein that those genes code for, and you get a very large collection of compounds, and then you have these massive machines that will 
squirt the compounds onto the proteins in little dishes and you'll see where, how they bind. And a number of drug companies conducted over 100 high-throughput screening campaigns against these rationally identified microbial broad-spectrum antibiotic targets. They tested well over 10 to the 7 compounds. So DOMAC tested about 100, or be of the order of 100. Drug industry between 1995 and 2000 tested in the order of 10 to the 7. Uh, and they found not one compound that was worth putting into clinical trials in people. Right? So the question is, how could one guy, or actually not, how could a team at Bayer in 1930 test 200 compounds and find something useful, whereas 70 years later, people could use the best available technology, test 10 to 7 compounds, and not find anything useful at all? And the short answer is, if your high-throughput modern technology doesn't produce output that is predictive of human outcomes of interest, it's effectively a false positive generating machine. Right? And that, that, so, so here is a little bit of the logic to explain that. So why do we test things in animal models or in computer models or in in vitro models? We test them because if we think if we make a bunch of measures of our potency in vitro in a test tube, that's going to somehow correlate with how useful it is in people. Right? And this graph simply represents, imagine we've got a bunch of therapeutic candidates. These could have been the compounds that DOMAC was testing in 1930, or they could be the compounds that Glaxo was testing in, in, in 1995. Right? Some of those compounds, the red ones, are going to be good enough to work in people, but most of them won't be. And we test them in our model system because we hope that the things that test well in our model system also tend to work better in people. Right? So you can kind of think about drug R&D as we've got a bunch of candidates and we can think about arranging them in a sort of measurement space where the axes represent the, way, the different ways we could measure the usefulness of those compounds, whether it's in a computer, in vitro, in an animal, or in a human trial. Right? But actually, we don't measure most of them in a human trial. But, that's, but we measure them in animals or in vitro because we think that predicts what will happen when we measure them in a human trial. And here's some real data from some real biological systems of the kind that people use to do drug discovery. Right? So this one I like because this is a real measure of how toxic a set of drugs are in people. Right? So this, this is sort of an expert consensus of maybe around 100, 150 drugs. One means pretty toxic. So these are drugs that the regulator withdrew or, or, or may have failed in human trials because they proved to be too toxic. These ones are drugs, the ones at the top are drugs that are really safe. You know, these ones might be drugs that cause liver toxicity in, you know, in some patients, right? Or, or there's a warning, but they're still on the market, right? And on the ho horizontal axis, we've got their score. It doesn't matter precisely what the score is. We've got their score in what was, a few years ago, probably the best in vitro model system for trying to predict whether or not these drugs were going to be toxic in people. And what you can see is that there's a bit of a correlation, but actually there's not a very strong correlation between how toxic this particular model system thinks the drugs are and how toxic they really are. So if you're using that model system to see how toxic the drugs are, you can get the wrong answer quite a lot of the time. Right. And the misindustrialization punchline is kind of shown here. So you can do a bit of maths, which I won't talk through, but you can sort of think about how good a model is in terms of the correlation coefficient between the, out, between the score on the model and the score in the human. Right? That's effectively a good working definition of whether a model's any good or not. And if you run the decision theoretic maths, what you find is that very, very small changes in the correlation between the output of your model and the human outcome of interest can be more important than 10 or 100-fold changes in the number of items you test in your model, right? So this is DOMAC's mice. So DOMAC tested 200 compounds in septic mice in 1930, so roughly 10 to the 2 compounds, roughly 200. If septic mice are a really predictive model of septic humans, right, and if the high-throughput screens are a really bad model of septic humans, i.e. their output doesn't correlate very highly with, it, with clinical outcomes in people, the best compound out of 200 tested in your mice 
The contours here show positive predictive value. That's the proportion of candidates that you think are good candidates but are good candidates, right? So the, it's the true positives over true positives and false positives. It's a measure of how predictive your system is, right? A good model testing 200 candidates from a particular universe is going to outperform a very bad model testing 10 to the 7 candidates, right? So bad models are false positive generators, right? And so... So, so the sort of aren't so back in terms of your misindustrialization, I think the drug industry has you know, people have got this now, right, to a certain extent. But I think there was a sort of naive assumption through the sort of eighties and nineties that if we build massive factories and we do lots and lots of the same thing, we build these large scale, very simplified models, that's gonna be a great way for discovering lots of drugs. But in fact, because drug candidates are rare, what it is, it's a great way of generating false positives, right? And actually, so, so the, the general message here is quality beats quantity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, yeah, so the misindustrialization that happened was a kind of push for quantity. We're going to do high-throughput screening. We're going to build these massive factories. We're going to test, you know, every drug class the same way. We're going to build scale. Didn't work, right? It, it was a big disappointment for people, yeah. Mm -hmm. So are there any good historical examples, any therapy areas um, you think where R&D has got better or worse as the model has changed? So it's, it's interesting. I think the antimicrobials is a good example because, because you had a sort of a, a, a set of antimicrobial discovery technologies that actually worked quite well. Got progressively more difficult for various reasons to do with resource depletion, right? So... so the technologies were quite good at discovering antibiotics, but what people found was they just kept rediscovering the same stuff, right? So it was a kind of resource depletion problem, but the models would actually find things that worked. Natural products were quite sort of hard to handle in a kind of industrial context. So the industry went over to these kind of high throughput screening models based on genomic targets, which really didn't work at all. Um, and actually what's happened is antimicrobial discovery has rediscovered screening for compounds that actually kill bacteria as a first step rather than screening for compounds that bind a protein as a first step, right? So, you've, so, so arguably, the sort of discovery process of antimicrobials, has, has, it, it was good, got bad, and actually it's got quite good again, right? Uh, um, uh, another thing that's happened is that, again, if we go back a couple... Hi, there we are. Where do I need to point this? Am I pointing at the right thing? Nothing, maybe. Sorry. Walk too far away, maybe, to make it work. Right, um, there's been an uptick, right? So actually, more drugs have started being discovered since about 2010. And that, I think, is partly to do with um, what is sometimes called personalised medicine. It's not a term I particularly like. Um, but it's the application of genomic technologies to sub-segment human diseases, right? So one reason things don't work in clinical trials is your animal model or your in vitro model might have been a model of 5% of the patients who had a particular subset of the disease, but it's not a good model for the other 95%, right? What genetic slicing and dicing lets us do, it lets us say, okay, 5% of lung cancer patients have a particular mutation. But, so that actually that means those, for those 5% of lung cancer patients, we actually understand what they've got. And actually, we can now make a decent model of that. And our model reflects that particular group of patients. So what the genetics has done is it's made it easy to match the experimental tests you do before you put things into people in, with the small groups of people who those models match. So hence, we've had an uptick in the number of approvals. But I should add, the size of the patient populations for which these drugs are being approved has gone down. Right, so there's a, there's a sort of, it's a sort of double-edged sword, right? As you slice and dice the patient groups, you're more likely to get things that work, but they're going to work in smaller, in smaller groups of people, right? So I think, I think that uptick is another example of, 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 a, of, a, sort of a better ability to match the experimental systems with the human pathology, but for smaller groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, so how in practice can you tell if a, um, if a new disease model is, is any good if it takes 10 years to progress the drug through to... Um, to, to the final product and see it in the market and so on. Okay, so, so you, you've asked me a question that's very close to my heart at the moment because that, that's quite a lot of the work I've been doing it since probably 2019 has been on that question, right? So the, the, yeah, the, the, the typical answer you get or the typical response 
maybe not typical, a common response you get when sort of talking to um, you know, folks in the drug industry who do R&D, when you say, well, actually, you know, it's worth thinking about better models, is, you know, big, yeah, that's, a, yeah, it's like, no surprise there, right? And, and, then, and then it's, well, how do I know if the model's any good or not? Because it's going to take me 10 years to get the drug into the clinic, uh, but I've got to make a decision now. And I think the, I, I think there's two responses to that kind of sort of nihilism, right? One is, Uh, one is actually on this graph, which is everyone knows better models are better, but if you run the decision theoretic maths, um, they're not just a bit better, they're massively better, right? So making your model a bit better should have the same productivity and input impact as doing 40 times as many experiments, right? It's a big deal. So, so this isn't, it's not just kind of important, it's really important to focus on getting the models as good as you can. And then the second component of the answer is, well, you're already choosing to use certain models, right? And presumably, if you didn't believe those models were predictive, you'd never have used them. But actually, at the moment, most of the assumptions around model choice are either hidden or bad. So again, I'm going to be slightly unfair here. You know, but if you ask lots of people in academia, why are you using that model? We say, well, it's, it's, it's the one I used during my PhD. Right? That's, or, or it's the one... Or if in the drug industry, why are you using that model? Oh, it's the one that, that, that Charles River, the CRO, they, they offer that model. Right? It's not... And actually, there's, there are a number of frameworks for evaluating screening disease models that simply formalise you know, what is arguably common sense. And, but the fact is, because I think a lot of people have underestimated the quantitative importance of better models, people don't use those frameworks. So over the last few years... Um, I've been collating frameworks that other people, fortunately, have developed, right? So I didn't have to develop them myself, but there's a number of them out there. But they, they, they typically consist of a kind of ch clever checklist, right, where you say, OK, <coughs> before I start on this discovery enterprise, I'm going to formally define what I think a good model looks like, right? And then I will try and find models that look like a good model. And if I can't find any... I'm not going to waste money doing this, right? So, so, so to be more concrete there, you say, well, okay, and, and the kind of criteria, you've got a bunch of criteria around what you might call biological recapitulation, right? So you will start with the human disease state, and you will try and enumerate and list those properties that you think a good model should capture if it is going to recapitulate the important aspects of the human disease state, right? So, you know, if, for example... Um, you know, uh, if, for example, it was a model of, inf you know, of infectious disease, right, well, um, do the bacteria in this model use the same genes to stay alive that they use to stay alive when they're in a human? Because if they don't, the targets that this model identifies are probably going to be the wrong targets, right? Um, another set of criteria around what you might call tests and endpoints, Right, so can we measure things in this model that are relevant to the human clinical state? And there's a wonderful example here, which basically I've entirely cribbed from work by a guy at Edinburgh called uh, Malcolm McLeod, uh, who's done wonderful work on um, ischemic stroke and certain other neurological disorders. But stroke, ischemic stroke, right, is caused by a blood clot in a cerebral artery, cutting off blood supply to the bit of the brain. You might think that's quite easy. You know, not necessarily a pleasant illness to model, but quite an easy disease to model in animals, right? Because you can, you can cut off the blood supply to a part of the brain, right? It's not like Alzheimer's where we don't really know what causes it. We don't really know if we can actually model it in, in, in animals. So hundreds and hundreds of drugs have proven effective in animal models of stroke. And only two drugs have proven the tiniest bit effective in human stroke trials. And there was a, a lovely example from a drug called Terilazad, which had positive results in about 20 animal studies and then went into human trials, and it didn't work. So you say, well, how is this that this drug that works in all of these animal trials doesn't work in humans? Well, if you look at the Terilazad animal studies, the median delay between giving the animal a stroke and injecting Terilazad was 10 minutes. If you looked at the human trials, the median delay, delay was five hours, right? So that's tests and endpoints, right? If you 
even if your animal recapitulates the human biology of stroke, if your tests and endpoints are just completely unlike anything you measure in the clinic that has clinical relevance, that decorrelates the output of your model from the human outcome of interest. There's a bunch of obvious stuff around what you might call statistical and experimental hygiene. Again, there's a big literature around that. So lots and lots of work is simply irreproducible, or it's done with sample sizes that are too small, right? and error bars that are too big, and it's not blinded, and there's publication bias. right? But there's very good frameworks and guidelines about how you manage those sorts of things. So again, a lot of what I've been doing over the last few few years has been trying to sort of systematize and sort of explain and test some of these frameworks that you can use to prospectively evaluate models before you know spending you know 10 million bucks on clinical trials that are based on the results of those models and, th and there's a very nice example which uh, there's, a, there's a paper I collaborated with a, a company called emulate who make what they call microphysiological systems so these are effectively trying to grow tissue in a in vitro system that's more realistic than cells grown in cell culture. So for example, if you get human liver cells and you take them out of a human liver, you can grow them in a dish for a while, but very quickly they stop behaving like human liver cells, right? There are ways of sort of making human tissues grow longer and be more realistic in vitro and emulate. They effectively have done a big study where they effectively compared their liver, human liver model against a predefined view of what a good model would look like, right? As far as doing things like calculating true and false positive rates for drugs that have been into people. So it's a to toxicology model, right? So you've got a bunch of drugs. We know some are toxic, we know some are not toxic. If you test those in your model, does it correctly say which ones are toxic and which ones are non-toxic, right? It's remarkable how often you read academic papers where people say, you know, this is a model of disease X but they haven't bothered testing all of the drugs that have been into humans to see if actually this predicts any of the answers correctly. Right? You know, we wouldn't make a telescope without calibrating it, but biologists are very happy to have models that are uncalibrated very often. We have a question. So I'm glad you asked that because it's made me realize I completely failed to understand it. So I explain it, right? So, so actually, you've, you, you've just asked something which I should have explained earlier. So thank you for that. So the better than the Beatles problem and models, I think these things are related, right? So imagine in 1950, we just have a universe of screening and disease models, and some of them are predictive and some of them aren't, right? What happens to the predictive models? They give us good drugs. That's Gerhard Domax mice. Those are animal models of hypertension, animal models of anti-infectives, um, animal models of stomach ulcer drugs. Not just animal models. You know, there's a bunch of good models that aren't animal models. In vitro models of anti-hepatitis of hepatitis C drugs. Right. So the models that work give us good drugs, and because they give us good drugs, those drugs then go off patent, and those therapy areas become commercially redundant. Right. And what that means is we're left with the diseases where the models haven't given us good drugs for the last 70 years, and those are the unpredictive models. And, and ironically, we keep using them precisely because they're not predictive, because they don't render themselves redundant. So, so again, if you look at oncology R&D at the moment, pretty much everyone working in oncology R&D will tell you the models are rubbish. But that's why they're still working in oncology R&D. If the models were good, they'd have, cured, they'd have solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or Alzheimer's. Why are you people still working in Alzheimer's already? Because the models don't work. Right. So funnily enough, you've got this, uh, the irony is, you know, the bad models keep, keep you in business year after year, whereas the good models put you out of business. I mean, that's a slightly too cynical way of saying it, but, but, is it, but, but you, you, I, think, I think it is the case that the therapy areas we're left with are the therapy areas where the models are lousy. Right. And then when the models get good, those therapy areas actually become commercially less attractive because they've suddenly got lots of decent drugs. Or, yeah, or, or rather, yes, exactly. I'd say the resource that is being depleted is the resource, we're depleting the resource of predictive models. Yeah, they have become, they have become an important, so that, so actually we're running out of good decision tools. Yeah, yeah. So thank, no, thank you for asking, because I completely hadn't explained it. Uh, 
so predictive tools as decision tools. Yeah. Um, in one of your papers, you you talk about there being a a distance between the people who are there doing the craft knowledge of these tools and the financial decision makers. Can you give us an insight as to what's happening in the company and why there is this distance? So, so, so this is. So I have some sort of anecdotes here, and I've talked to other people who say who say the same kind of thing. Right? This may not be true everywhere, but you know, I worked for a drug company where we sent compounds off to be tested at CROs, you know, lots of small drug companies where you don't run your own animal stuff or your compound testing in-house. You'll send it off to someone else who's got some standard models that they test uh, the compounds in. And these were some oncology models, both, uh, both mainly in vitro, actually, mainly sort of cancer cell line models. And so we'd send these compounds off, and um, we'd get these results back, which just wouldn't make any sense. Well, you know, sort of, we'd send the same compounds to different CROs, and we get different results back, right? And this sort of seems to make no sense at all. And then we hired someone who had been a cancer biologist in the drug industry for 40 years, and he knew all the CROs really well. And he would say, okay, yeah, but these people, they'll probably be using a particular sort of solvent. And if you're using that solvent and that particular cell line, that's really not going to work very well. Right, so, so actually you need to ignore those set of results and those ones who'd be using a different solvent in that particular cell, and that one's probably believable. Right? And, and you find that as well. People understand the models that they work on. There's, a lot of kind of, there's an awful lot of knowledge about the science that people do that isn't really systematized or communicated very well, but actually is very important if you're making decisions based on that science. And I think in a lot of companies, um, or rather, I think... It's almost as if scientists are not trained to talk about that. So it's, and it's not just in companies. So I went to a very interesting, I went to a very, very good conference recently in Oxford around translational medicine, where there's a lot of sort of basic science, but clinically interesting basic science that may have relevance and may lead to drugs that go into the clinic. And one thing that struck me, now, now I'm a bit of a sort of model geek, was all of the scientists would sit and give their talks, and they would say, you know, I therefore t t tested hypothesis X in model Y, and here's what I found, right? But actually, I now know that, the, that they shouldn't have spent their time telling me about their hypothesis and about what they found. They should have actually spent their time telling me that what, why they think that model is telling them anything at all that's predictive about people. Because actually, the provenance of the data is almost more important than the data itself. Or to put it another way, scientific papers always go on about the p-value and the effect size. That's what everyone looks at. What's the p-value? What's the effect size? Whereas really what you're saying is, what is the provenance of the data? Is that p-value and effect size relevant to anything, right? Uh, or, or, or there's a good term called data pedigree, which, which um, there's a wonderful book by someone whose name I can't remember, or two people whose name I can't remember, but it's cited in, in, in the 2022 paper, where they talk a lot about this idea that, that data is, you shouldn't just worry about the p-value and the effect size, it's really understanding about where it came from, how it was generated, whether it's going to be relevant to people. Those are actually the difficult questions, right? But it's interesting, sort of conventional science, you know, if you go to a science conference, that's not what people talk about. They talk about their p-value, their effect size, the hypothesis they were testing, not whether any of it is believable or relevant, but actually the important question is, is whether it's believable and relevant, right? Which isn't discussed. And so I think it's the same thing about stuff in the lab. People will say, well, here's my p-value and here's here's my effect size, but actually, unless you really know the details of the model in which it was generated, you don't really know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, so predictive validity and these, these new tools, they take a tremendous amount of work to, to improve them and to, to create them. It, and this will be my, my last question. Um, whose job then is it to do that and who should be doing it and, and what, what, is, what is the solution to this problem? So... So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the problem first, because I think solutions are tricky, right? So one thing that I think has become clear is that um, it's surprisingly difficult for the private sector, it's not impossible, but it's surprisingly difficult for the private sector to make money out of a better disease model. So if, if I give you the oncology example, in, in oncology, drug companies know the models are rubbish, but they all use the models. And I've talked to 
folks in drug companies say, well, why don't you spend some more money on making better oncology models? And a sort of, I would say a sort of a caricature of the answer goes along these lines, is that, look, we could spend lots of money and years developing a better way of modeling whether these compounds are going to work in people. But the minute we have a compound where the mechanism is known that shows positive results in an early clinical trial in humans, everyone will know that mechanism works, even if they didn't invest in the model. Right, so I, we can't appropriate enough of the economic value of the investment in the model to make it worthwhile. Uh, so there's a few ways you get around that. One way you try and get around it is by industry consortia. Right, so what you say is, look, if you've got a bunch of companies that test drugs in oncology, you try and form pre-competitive consortia where they fund the investment in better models that they can all use, right? Uh, uh, the other way is you bite the bullet and you do public sector funding. I mean, for what it's worth, my view is I don't think academia is really set up to do this sort of thing, because a lot of it's not very glamorous, right? It's kind of... And it's expensive, and it's quite large scale. You know, to do it in oncology, you'd have to test lots of old drugs. You know, you'd have to do it exactly the same every time, so it's kind of reproducible, repeatable. It doesn't feel very glamorous, right? But I think I, my view is it's, it's, it's either public funding or industry consortia will help. And then I think another thing that will help, I probably haven't got time to talk about, is better financial valuation models will help. Because at the moment, the tools that people in investment use to value drugs are relatively insensitive to model quality and decision quality. And what that means is they won't pay extra for an asset that has been discovered using better models. And an asset that's been discovered using better models is then more likely to work in people. But the way people value assets, they can't really reflect that in their calculations, so they won't pay more for something that's more likely to work. Thank you. Um, so that's all the, the questions I have. Um, I would like to open up to audience questions now. We have two. Uh, can I ask the, uh, our colleague at the back there? Hi, Jeff. Um, I was just wanted to ask how you thought uh, levels of, and you partially answered it in the last bit regarding the consortia that you said, how you think the pharmaceutical industry's business model has changed over the last 20 years, and how we can expect um, to be more efficient at drug discovery if So I think, I think the, I mean, I think the sad truth is, I think if you look in aggregate at the drug industry, um, arguably there's not huge evidence of greater efficiency in recent years, right? So if you look at aggregate measures like, um, sort of aggregate financial measures that are industry-wide, it doesn't look like there have been great efficiency gains. But I do think there are some companies who've, who seem to do stuff a bit differently and um, better, or companies that have sort of turned around their productivity, which is clearly difficult to do because not everyone does it. So there's one company that I often talk about called Vertex, who I think have a very clear view of, of the problems that are likely to be tractable. So rather than saying, you know, disease X is really common, so we need to work on disease X, they say, what diseases do we think we can actually represent in the laboratory in a way that will give us the right answer when we put things into people? And that means they work on a rather different set of problems. So they've, they've, they've done a lot of work on certain rare diseases, genetic diseases, where, for example, they can get human tissue, where they think that human tissue is going to be predictive of humans. Because, you know, of course, human tissue isn't always predictive of humans, right? Um, so I think there's a lot around problem choice. And then there's another... I think AstraZeneca have sort of done a bit of an R&D productivity turnaround. And the sort of... The, the simple sort of slogan, actually, that they don't apply, that other people apply to it, is what you might call, they've realised that you've got to incentivize truth-seeking rather than progression-seeking behaviour, right? So it's very easy in big companies to incentivize people to do slightly the wrong things. You know, I need you to produce 10 drug candidates, right? Well, if, someone, if, if that's what you incentivize people to do, you'll get 10 lousy drug candidates, right? <laughs> you need to get... You need to, so I think Astra have had some success at that, but I think it's also, I think also it's around 
a clearer view on the kind of problems that are tractable. Right? But again, the aggregate industry economic data I've seen suggests that although more drugs are coming out of the pipe, because they tend to be for smaller markets, the overall financial um, trends haven't really changed very much. So I think, so I haven't really thought about this much, so much from government funding perspectives, but I think from um, when I think about sort of applying this in private sector companies or in the private sector, my view is a lot of the pull has to come from the, from the, the people putting in the capital, right? So the way you get the scientists to do the right thing is, make, is effectively paying them to do the right thing, I mean, directly or indirectly. Right, so I think if, if venture capital firms, for example, had more rigorous rules around the sorts of things they wanted to see documented before funding assets that have come out of a lab, then that would pull the labs in the right direction. Yeah. 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 So, so I've generally steered away from organisational explanations, and I'll tell you why. Um, let's suppose this was the oil industry, right? And it cost a hundred times more to suck a barrel of oil out of the ground, despite the fact our oil drilling technology had got a thousand times cheaper. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd look for a geological explanation, right? You'd say you wouldn't say, well, actually, maybe the reporting lines are wrong, or we've got the incentives a bit wrong. Right, I think, I think so, so I'm not saying organisational things aren't important, because I think they are, but the, I've shied away from organisational explanations just because I don't think they can account for the magnitude of the productivity changes we've seen. So it's not got twice as expensive, or four times as expensive, or ten times as expensive. It's got a hundred times as expensive, despite the fact the technology's got millions of times better. So, so again, I'm not trying to sort of belittle the organisational explanations. They may be important but I think I haven't focused on them because it struck me that they just didn't have the quantitative power. Whereas explanations around things like model validity, right, that, it seems to me to be playing in the explanation game here, you've got to explain like two orders, an order of magnitude or two before you're even worth putting on the list, right? And, you know, the regulation, that does because, you know, trials get ten, have got ten times bigger, right? So lots of things get onto that list, but I think you know, we've got to deal with the things that explain orders of magnitude before we start thinking about the things that may make a difference at the margins.
maybe some companies who have a large share of the pipeline could collaborate with the um, like smaller <coughs> organizations that invest in uh, like screening of these uh, disease diffusion tools. And uh, I was wondering, like, uh, uh, how do you see this? Like, uh, this can be achieved in the future, like with with like uh, like using like government like work of certain like policy, um, you know. Uh, people could like without them like supporting this for like government like how how do you see this situation? yeah so I think I think <laughs> um, I mean there's, there's sort of two things I'd say one is I think unless you sort of run a bit of decision theoretic and financial maths you don't realize how important it is mm -hmm. right so one thing that we tried to do with that paper was just you know put that sort of decision theoretic and financial maths in the public domain so you realize this maybe is more important than you thought. Uh, I think there's another thing which is, again, at the moment, the way, so, very so there's a very practical problem that some companies with, with, who believe they have better drug discovery technology at the moment face. Right, so let's suppose you, you think, okay, I've invented this fantastic model for Alzheimer's, right? It's gonna revolutionize Alzheimer's drug discovery. It's fantastic. Well, at the moment, the trouble is when you go to drug companies, they say, I can't tell which Alzheimer's models are good or bad. So the one you've got might be good, but because I can't tell what's good or bad, I'm not going to pay more for it. So, so you, need to imp you need to get people into the idea that models are valuable, right? So the companies that are better models at the moment, they've got a problem. They don't have the tools or the techniques to evaluate their own models. And their customers don't have the tools or techniques to evaluate the models. And none of them have the tools or techniques to say how much a better model is worth. So one of the practical things is around getting people used to developing and using tools for model evaluation and also thinking about the, the financials in the right way. Um, and, I, I, and I think if you do that, that at least goes some way towards getting industry consortia to try and invest in the right kind of things. So um, there's two wonderful papers by a guy called Andreas Bender, which were published quite recently or within the last couple of years in Drug Discovery, Te Drug Discovery Today, which I would recommend anyone interested in AI and drug discovery should read. And so I don't want to appear to be a Luddite here. So I actually have professional interest in AI and drug discovery. So I, I worked for a company that, if it was trying to raise money now, would say it was doing AI, although it, there was a different fashionable name for it back when I worked for it. Um, so we used to call it bioinformatics and network pharmacology. And I do some work now for a company that is a kind of AI-based drug discovery company. But I think anyone imagining that AI is going to revolutionize drug discovery needs to bear in mind a few things, right? Lots of things that are now called AI have been done in the drug industry for a very long time in a way that they haven't been done in other industries. So, for example, all of the genomicists, right, they... Lots of them went to work in the drug industry. You know, computational chemistry, that's been happening in the drug industry for a long time. Molecular docking, that's, people have been doing that for 40 years. The protein folding problem, one of the classic AI problems, right? Where have people been doing that? They've been doing it in the drug industry. So, so lots of things that are now sort of thrown into the AI bucket, people have been doing in the drug industry for 50 years, right? And in my view, AI is very useful for chemistry, i.e. making compounds that might fit proteins better. That is sometimes the rate-limiting step in drug R&D, but often it's not. And the real constraint is data, data so quantity and quality. Um, and that's not going to be fixed anytime soon it's really expensive to fix so if you think about places where sort of AI has radically transformed things it's places where you can cap you can create lots of data really quickly you can feed it into an algorithm and then you can do something commercially useful with that data quite quickly 
right? So it's, it's so actually the sort of AI revolution. It's not necessarily around the middle bits, the clever, the sort of the the clever algorithms. It's around the data acquisition and then the ability to monetize the output of the algorithm, right? And Arguably, it's the first bit and the last bit that's changed very quickly with everyone having sort of, you know, mobile devices on them and sort of stuff. And in the drug industry, you don't, you know, you don't have those three things all happening at the same time. But I would say go and, go and read the Andreas Bender papers because I think he is much more articulate and clear on the data constraints around AI and drug discovery than I ever will be. Sorry, sorry, could you just ask that again? Is it just uh, I mean, uh, well, the, the latency of our same condition for uh, vary from different stages of the cells or new state to state use of uh, technology. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, so no, it'll be, it'll be massively variable, right? So, um, and it's going to be, and they're also going to be quite sort of domain specific, right? So, um, I'll give you an example. I think. A lot of the so so models are predictive of something, right? So there's there's a, there's a very useful idea that um, I came across from a friend of mine who was a cosmologist originally and not a biologist, and and I must have been like 35 or 40 before I ever came across this idea, and I couldn't believe I'd been a biologist and I was 40 and I hadn't heard it, and it was the idea of what's called models, this idea called domains of validity. So if you talk to physicists or engineers, they have this idea called domains of validity. So, so if you've got a model like um, Newton's laws of motion, right, which those are, those are really good for predicting the movement of planets around the sun or the movement of satellites around the earth, right? But if you try and look at things the size of an atom, they don't work anymore. Or if you try and look at a black hole, they don't work. So there are certain parameters within which this model is predictive but then there are other parameters w within which it's not predictive, right? And it's exactly the same with screening and disease models in drug R&D. So if I come back to the example I talked about with ischemic stroke, right, where this, this drug called Terilazad worked in animals, <laughs> didn't work in people, well, it worked in animals if you tested it five minutes after you gave it to the animal, five, if you gave it five minutes after the stroke. It didn't work in people if you gave it five hours after the stroke. Right, so there's an obvious question about domains of validity. What were the domains of validity of the animal stroke models? Well, right, they, they may well be valid within, a five, within that domain of validity where the gap between giving the drug and testing the stroke is five minutes, but they're not valid after five hours. So, so, the, so another way of thinking about screening and disease models is thinking very closely about is the thing I'm trying to predict actually going to be predictable from the model and some things will be predictable and some things won't and sometimes the thing you're trying to predict will lie within the model's domains of validity and sometimes it will lie without and it's going to be quite context and question specific right so, so you know the, the, the animal models of stroke might be a great model of human stroke if you can give the drug after five minutes but you can't give the drug after five minutes in a human so it's, that's, that's not a useful model right I don't know, but I do know, since, since I got interested in this sort of area, I, I found out, it took me a long time before I found this out, but I found out that actually innovation economists think, or some innovation economists think this is happening everywhere. So there's a big area of sort of debate amongst innovation economists that innovation is slowing down more generally, right? And that's reflected in things like slow down in productivity growth. So you, again, if you, you know, if you just read the sort of popular press in the UK, you know, you'll hear about sort of, you know, the productivity problem. Well, actually, arguably, since the sort of 1970s, you know, the Western world or the world has had a productivity problem. Um, and it's not entirely clear 
well, there's, 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 there's a lot of argument about what's causing it. So again, I found out relatively recently that although the drug industry may look like an extreme example, it's not the only example. And there seems to have been a more general productivity slowdown. In fact, again, though, this is sort of going slightly off piece, if you don't mind. But I read a because I got interested in this, I, there's a fantastic book by a guy called Gordon called The Rise and Fall of American Growth which basically says, you know, if it, sort of industrial, industrialization happened at different times in different countries. But if you, if you look in the US, basically, you had a period from 1875 to 1975 when the modern world was created. So if you look at an American kitchen now, there is only one domestic appliance that has been added since 1975, which is microwave oven, right? So if you, but if you went into American kitchen from 1975, it looks pretty much like an American kitchen now. In... 1900s, no Americans had cars, right? By 1920, something like 50% of American households had a car. You had this incredible period of very, very rapid productivity growth, lots of big inventions coming at the same time. And in the Gordon book, he either makes or he quotes a wonderful thing around economic growth, which he says, between the end of the Roman Empire and 1720, in terms of economic growth and productivity improvement, nothing happened, right? Now, I may be misremembering the dates slightly, but there have been large periods of human history, actually, when there hasn't been much economic growth, and the lives of people just haven't changed for centuries and centuries. And it may be, actually, what we're looking at is we're looking at the tail end of a very unusual period in human history, right, which was this, this period from sort of 19, 1875 to 1975, when, boom, the modern world was created. And actually, you know, that's sort of once in a millennium, never to be repeated period, and actually progress. Although, I, you know, IT progress has be, be, changed a lot but again in the Gordon book he says you know getting an iPhone well compared to getting indoor plumbing a car you know air travel electricity in your house getting an iPhone isn't a big deal right So, so, so I'm going to answer part of your question, because on the sort of second part, I don't really know. But the first part of your question is actually a very good question. And again, it sort of identifies something I glossed over, which is, why do we use measures, right? We often use measures because they're easy to get, not because they're important. So again, if you think about the measures I showed on those graphs, number of drugs per billion dollars, DNA sequencing efficiency, X-ray crystallography efficiency, why did I pick those measures? Because they're accessible, right? Now, arguably, I think if one wanted a better measure of pharmaceutical R&D productivity, you would want to look at something like quality-adjusted life years gained for the world as a whole per billion dollars private and public sector spent on R&D. And the reason I don't have that is not because it's not important. It's because it's impossibly difficult to calculate and horribly contentious, right? Um, but I do think a lot of debates around biomedical innovation are hampered by the fact, actually, the, the, the benefits of innovation are so hard to measure um, for, a number of, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, but, but, yeah, you're, you're right. that It may be, or rather, we can measure financial performance. That's quite easy to measure. That's been declining since around 2000. We can measure the number of drugs per billion dollars spent. That's quite easy to measure. That's been declining, but then stabilized and sort of bumping around a bit now, not going up or down. But the really important things are really hard to measure. Any last questions from our audience? Well, I would like to thank especially Dr. Jack Scannell 
but also to everyone who asked this great question. Thank you. No, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. And so to, to our guest here tonight, I hope you keep in touch with us and uh, please join in any other In Conversation events that, that you see on Imogen website. And Monica is our, our person there to talk to. And thank you very much to all our students and I will see you next week. Thanks. Thank you.